The brew house was created to capture and share with you the long history of the Genesee Brewery. But the brewery itself isn't half as interesting as the beer and the people who make it. Visit GeneseeBrewHouse.com. Hello everyone and welcome to the Rochester Press Box brought to you by the Genesee Brewhouse. I am Dave Yates sitting in for Bill Pucko and we are joined by Carl Falk. Thanks for having me guys. Oh, always a pleasure. Mike Catalana. Good to be here. And of course, the fashion guru yeah. of the show. Absolutely. Sir Duffy. Well, what I got today. Well, I missed. I, we were promoing Crushed at Cancer last week. Uh, Charles Clay released by the Bills. I am the world's biggest Charles Clay fan. So, in honor of him, in memory of him, uh, my Charles Clay <laughs> Bills jersey today. What's well, nice? You go to like Marshalls right now, seven bucks. Get that same jersey. It's uh, fantastic. Let's go to Arizona, where he was signed immediately. <laughs> yeah, he gets where you go to retire. Right there, you go. So, what are you still doing here? <laughs> oh, all right. Let's talk NHL. Let's talk Sabers. The trade deadline. Duff, let's start with you. Let's talk about what the Sabres did and what they didn't do. I think they did exactly what they were supposed to do. I'm very happy with the trade deadline. You ship out a prospect in Brandon Gooley who is not, I mean, he's still a question mark. You get a guy in Montour from Anaheim who you know can play in the NHL. He fits the system more than what Gooley potentially did. And Gooley was jumped over by a couple of defensemen, right? Like he wasn't going to be a lock to make the Sabres roster next season. I'm fine with that. You give up a first round pick, which is rough, but that pick probably is going to be between 15 and 30 somewhere because it's either San Jose or St. Louis's pick. So you essentially get Montour for a question mark prospect and what your first round pick would have been. I'm cool. I'm glad they didn't decide to do anything else. There were rumors that Ristolainen was going to end up moving and that I think that would have been insane. Listen, we have a, a we talked about it last week, an historical offseason where you have a lot of young players that are due to make a lot of money that other teams that are playing well can't afford. That's where you make up your ground there and maybe we see another pick dealt at the deadline. All right, the draft, I'm sorry. Yeah, it could happen. I'm with Pat on this because I think they they weren't, you know, you look in terms of buyers or sellers. They sort of did a little bit of both. But in this case, look, with Gooley, I think everybody was sort of excited of him as a prospect. But Chris Taylor said it during the beginning of the year before the season starts about prospects in Rochester. Basically said, you're either moving up or you're moving out. And he really wasn't moving up. Now, that doesn't mean the guy can't play and it won't find his way in Anaheim. But Montour is a guy who's done it. He'll be getting paid pretty soon, too. Maybe they didn't want to pay him. I like the move. I think it's an aggressive move. We all know what they need, right? They've got a first line. They've got defense. They've got now some better puck handlers. They need that second line. They need dependable scoring there. And they need to figure out what they want to do with the goaltender position. So it's not all bad. It's just been incredibly frustrating to watch. And I think what's more frustrating was that 10-game winning streak gave us all false yep. hope. Everyone looks at that and thinks, oh, they're a playoff team. Jason Bottrell's building something, and it's going to take time. And this trade deadline, while a lot of people wanted to risk the line and move, other go buy somebody big, that's not what he's going to do. That's not how he's going to build this thing. If you take that 10-game winning streak mentality away, this has been a better year. They're ahead of last year. They're building towards something. So I do think he did a good job at the deadline. There's one thing that scares me with that Montour deal coming from Anaheim. It's a defenseman tailor-made for the system that Housley wants to run, which tells me that Housley is going to get another full season next year. And not only that, they're going to go out and get the players that Housley needs to run his, quote, system. Fine, but if you have your guys and the system doesn't work out again next year, well, now you have to go find a coach along the same lines uh, mental-wise as Housley does, or else you have all these prospects which you can't use. I mean, that's why Montour had fallen down the depth chart so far in Anaheim. They didn't know how to use them the right way. So we're kind of finding ourselves in another bill cycle where you go out and get the players for the general manager and the coach. The coach gets blown out. Now we have these five or six high-priced free agents that we signed that we can't use. But it also may tell you that Jason Bottrell likes that system. He did hire Phil Housley. He he wants those puck carrying defensemen that come up into the zone and the make plays. So in that way, and the wrist aligning deal, you're talking to Tampa. Tampa is so good and so loaded right now from such a position of strength. I don't think you really want to be trading with them. They're not desperate. No. If they want to wrist align and they're not going to give you the farm to get a guy. Maybe in the offseason, if they don't win the cup, they may be looking to make deals and maybe you can revisit that. But I'm glad they didn't make that deal. All right. We are back with more of the Rochester Press Box right after this.
The Press Box is brought to you in part by Bay and Goodman Pizza, a local Rochester favorite. Corner of North Winton and Browncroft, Bay and Goodman Pizza. Welcome back once again to the Rochester Press Box, brought to you by the Genesee Brew House. I am Dave Yates, sitting in for Bill Fogel. Let's talk a little Syracuse basketball, Carl. Let's talk about uh, two losses to the Tobacco Road teams and uh, kind of puts a big dent in what we're hoping for as far as their postseason goes. Yes and no. Uh, the postseason, when you start looking at the big picture, the teams that will be bubble teams, I think Syracuse's resume will hold up pretty well. The loss on Saturday to Duke was predictable, even without Zion Williamson. This last game against North Carolina, likewise. Carolina is a very good team. Those two teams will be either a one or two seed in the tournament. So I don't think that's going to hurt them. The bigger game is what is against Wake Forest this weekend. If they win that game, that prevents another bad loss, which they cannot afford on their resume. It gets them to 19 wins overall and 10 wins in the ACC. That alone should get them in. This team's flawed offensively and has been all year. Frank Howard, whether it be the injury or ineptness, has not been good. If you think about where they get points outside of Tyus Battle, there's nobody with a consistent contribution on this team. So they're limited, but I think they still get in. I was encouraged by the way they played in the two losses. I think they have shown flashes. Now, look, if you're talking about a team that can win four games and get to a Final Four – uh, yeah, can they do that? Well, we've seen them do it before from this spot. But but the whole year they've been listed seems to be as like seven, eight, nine seed. I think they're going to stay in there. But as an eight, nine team, I will say this about Syracuse. Those one seeds are not going to want to see them no. be the team come out because they do play well against the top competition. And that Carolina game, I and mean, when they do shoot the ball, they are highly competitive in these games. So it, I don't know how it's going to end up for them, but even though they lost those games, I think I'm a little more encouraged than what sometimes you see against lesser teams when they don't show up as much. Yeah, we talked about it a few weeks ago, right? Like, Bayheim is really good at coaching in the big games, and he may be not so good at coaching in the games that are just run of the mill. I agree with Mike 100% that if they are in a tournament in a – it doesn't even really have to be – a great spot. I mean, they played themselves into the tournament and ended up making a run a couple of years ago, right? I just find it interesting. College basketball, men's college basketball, is the only sport where you can have a moral victory that matters. We were just talking about the Sabres, and they play really well against the Lightning Capitals and uh, Maple Leafs back-to-back-to-back. But it doesn't mean anything, right? Syracuse goes out last weekend, loses a close game to Duke, plays really well against North Carolina. That's going to mean something to get them into the tournament, right? You don't have to be great. You just have to play well enough against the teams that are going to be great. So a quality loss as opposed to a quality win. Right. Kind of stupid, right? It it means something up until the tournament starts. And then at that point, it's like, you know, you got to win or you're done. It's nice to have moral victories. But, yeah, they have shown – I can't imagine any committee member that and watch them these last two games doesn't look at Syracuse and say that's a tournament team. Maybe not a great team, but that's a tournament team. And plus, how much does the the pedigree and the history play into that? It selection? all goes in. And, yeah. and to your point about the the losses, strength of schedule is a very important metric that plays in when you're playing in the ACC and you got Duke, Carolina, Virginia in a couple weeks. This strength of schedule, I think theirs will be projected at like. 10 overall this year. so Should be a lock then. Yeah, I, I think they'll get in. It's just a matter of where they're seated and then where the committee might match them up because it is interesting as who they could play. I always wonder, is there a second round matchup? I don't know how it would work out with a with a Washington. Is there a uh, second round matchup potentially with UB? Could be a first round matchup with UB or Washington. It could be, right? right? Depending on how the high or how far Syracuse says. They love those kind of matchups. They do. <laughs> and then the best part be about awesome, it is yeah. when the committee was like, oh, we didn't pay attention. Yeah, they, no. they never pay attention to that. It's just we, way it's just it's a draw. It was yeah, a fluke, it exactly. Works, so. No, that never happens. Not at all. And we're back with more of the Rochester Press Box right after this. Here's the Press Box trivia question brought to you by Market View Liquor, where exceptional customer service meets an extensive selection. Jefferson Road at 390. Dang it. 
today is all about belief. Right? It's not enough for me to believe it. It's not enough for Coach Hill or Coach Barsham to believe it. You have to be the ones that believe that you are capable of running the way that we all know you are capable of and that those negative thoughts that are coming into your head, you can acknowledge and push away. What's your response to them going to be? Five more meters, five more meters, five more meters. Here's a Press Box Trivia answer brought to you by Market View Liquor, where exceptional customer service meets an extensive selection. Jefferson Road at 390. Welcome back once again to the Rochester Press Box, brought to you by the Genesee Brew House. I am Dave Yates. It is time now for Like It or Not. And Carl, let's talk a little bit about the NFL. Let's talk about the NFL Combine. Like it on TV as a spectacle or not? I have a talk radio show. Of course I like it on TV. <laughs> People watch the NFL. This is the NFL making sure we pay attention 12 months a year. It's broadcast now on several channels. New networks are getting in. I don't personally watch it. I can't stand to watch guys running patterns and it, it means nothing to me, but it's become a spectacle. And the NFL GMs, owners, coaches, they go there, they network, they lay groundwork for guys like Charles Clay to get overpaid. It's, <laughs> it's a great spot for many things, but for me in my profession, it's outstanding because I get something more to talk about. Right. Yeah, I, I've been the last few years to the combine. We didn't go. I'm sorry, not my show, go ahead. <laughs> I was going to owe you. That's my fault. It's, go ahead. Go, there we go. Uh, up until there. Wait a minute, can you do that one more time? Uh, there we go. I hope you have a tight shot of that. Uh, I don't care once they're out on the field. I mean, when I've been there, to Carl's point, it's also where a lot of news gets made. Right. Everybody talks. And sometimes there's messages out there that maybe they're trying to send to agents or about their own team or what their plans are or the disinformation. It all starts now. And we all know everything that's leaked, everybody should know, comes from agents and agents try to get things out of there. So the point about the NFL making, yeah, every once in a while there's a guy who blows up the combine with this tremendous 40-yard time. Right. <laughs> or John Ross, the wide receiver who may get traded now where he's flying down the field. But I think it's more about what's said at the combine than it is what we see on the field. And that's how the NFL stays in everybody's mind 11 Quote months and three relevant. weeks a year. <laughs> no, I'm all about it. And I don't know three quarters of the guys that are at the combine. I have no idea who they are. I'm not a huge college football guy, right? But I will watch hours of this combine coverage and make fun of it, but I'm watching it, right? <laughs> and then you get these, you know, legends that live on forever. For example, a guy like Life Larson, defensive yes. end from Iceland, <laughs> if I'm not mistaken. The Bills end up taking him in the seventh round, but he sets the NFL combine record for uh, bench press, and nobody's ever heard of this guy, and he comes out of nowhere, and it's great stuff like that. Plus, every once in a while, you get guys getting hit in the face with balls, right? Who was it? Uh, oh, God. He's on the Bills team right now. The defensive back. Oh, who was, was it Taron Johnson? Yes, it was Taron. Yeah, Taron Johnson. Who, yeah, takes a... It's awesome. And I also like watching really big fat guys in tight shirts run 40-yard dashes. It makes yeah. me laugh really hard. That's really scary. It's funny. Check it out sometime. Just saying. I cry for help. Ooh, Mike. Yankee signing Aaron Hicks. Uh, you know, isn't it funny? The deal looks like people are like, oh, that's, that's a pretty good deal. I mean, it's $70 million for Aaron Hicks. Uh, Ten-year deal. Aaron Hicks is a really good player. Twins fans cringe all the time because Aaron Hicks was supposed to be that guy for them. He's in the Yankees. That is what's called a reasonable contract in Major League Baseball, isn't it? Yeah, but seven years of Aaron Hicks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you start talking center fielders for the New York Yankees, longest tenure. You've got some guys, you know, Mano, DiMaggio, Hicks. Right. Just some guys. Yeah, but it's, it's <laughs> I mean, at that amount? The last seven-year center fielder was Jacoby Ellsbury. By the way, hurt again already. Right. I know be beating <laughs> the early <laughs> season rush. This can be uh, <laughs> tough. But it's, it's a reasonable Deep. Dollar amount. Dollar yes. amount. So but he could always be moved. Years, like, Aaron Hicks. Yeah. yeah, and you know what? Again, he was a pretty good player for them. Certainly better than Jacoby Ellsberg. This is true. I see you got the jersey already. Mm -hmm. Bills are looking for a new Billy Buffalo. What do you think? Uh, can I be honest with you? If I could get health benefits, I would do that job in a second. <laughs> it's always been a dream of mine to go be like a professional mascot. I think I'd be really good at it. I'm surprisingly agile for a man my size. <laughs>
You can see that in the combine. Yeah, I'll put yeah. on a tight shirt. They should have the combine for mascots. I would totally do that. That yeah, would be good TV. Do. They probably they do. Yeah, yeah. They <laughs> might get better viewership. Who yeah. knows? That's the, the Philly fanatic all day long. <laughs> <laughs> all right, we are back with more of the Rochester Press Box right after this. And now here's this week's MVP experience stat of the week, brought to you by Sport Clips, where it's good to be a guy. No appointment ever needed. Two for two egg and cheese wraps, two for four bagels with cream cheese spread, and two for five bacon, egg, and cheese croissants with Dunkin' Go-To's. America runs on Dunkin'. And welcome back once again to the Rochester Press Box, brought to you by the Genesee Brew House. It is time now for Unfinished Business, brought to you by Dunkin' Donuts. America runs on Dunkin'. And Duff, we'll start with you. What do you got? Oh, well, I'm wearing the Charles Clay jersey. And I told you earlier, I'm a card-carrying member of the Charles Clay fan club. But this jersey should also serve as a little bit of a warning. There's a whole bunch of excitement in Western New York because the Bills have over $80 million in cap space to spend this offseason. And in some fans' minds, that translates to automatic success. This jersey is proof that just because you find a guy to pay money to doesn't mean you're going to be successful. Now, don't get me wrong. I think there are lots of factors that went into Charles Clay not having the career that he could have had in Buffalo. But that contract will follow him forever. And just because you're willing to spend money on someone doesn't necessarily mean they're going to be that star. It's exciting that there's space for the Bills front office to do what they want. But the question is, what do they want to do? And if you spend that money poorly, not only are you tanking your team now, you're setting your team back three, five, seven years in the future. So, sure, I'm a little bit excited to have that kind of money. I'll feel better when I find out where that money is going come opening day. All right, Carl? Well, we're getting to that time of year. March Madness just around the corner. This weekend, the Section 5 Championships down at the Blue Cross Arena. And you look along college basketball, the landscape is littered now with college basketball stars from Section 5, guys like Quentin Rose down at Temple. You've got Anthony Lamb at Vermont and Isaiah Carter at Washington, who will be joined by Isaiah Stewart next year. But there's a guy at Siena that is starting to get some buzz, Jalen Pickett was from Aquinas. He went to prep school and now is a freshman. He's won the freshman in the MAC eight out of nine weeks. This kid could be the player in the Metro Atlanta Conference, player of the year. He has been so good that he was number 29 on an NBA draft chart the other day. Jalen Pickett was the guy who was overlooked in the recruiting cycle. He won't be overlooked for long. Mike? Yeah, these are the kind of guys, too, that um, have outplayed what people thought. Yeah. And Lamb, I mean, Lamb He's has been, been so good. spectacular at that level. Uh, I'm going to go back to the NFL for a second. Very interesting what's going on with the New York Giants. Uh, their coach and general manager both had come out this week saying they, they still are keeping Eli Manning as the quarterback. Now, you got to believe them, don't you? The idea that Eli will be back again. But a lot of times teams are just throwing this out there. There's draft picks. Last year, they had an opportunity to take quarterback. They got Saquon Barkley, a great player, but they kept Eli. It didn't work all out. Work out all that great. But now they get another opportunity. Could they draft a quarterback? Could they go for somebody else? Nick Foles may be out there if they wanted to make a play, but they're sticking with Eli. I get it. The idea why the Giants have a lot of respect for Eli. I don't know if you've heard this before, but he won two Super Bowls with the Giants. <laughs> it gets mentioned it. every once in a while. <laughs> But it's not about what you did in the past. It's what you can do from 2019 going forward. So just because they say it, I don't know if you should believe it, but right now the Giants are saying Eli is still their guy. Is that kind of like an owner coming out and giving a coach a vote of confidence? It, it <laughs> is because they can say this now with the quarterback because there are options still out there. But I kind of think that's really what their plan is, that they're going to keep him. Well, but what's the other option? You're going to go with Nick Foles, right? Are you going to be able to get him within the division for a reasonable price that's not going to set you back even further? I mean, I think that going with Eli Manning might legitimately be your best play right now and figure it out after next season. Cowboys fan and the Eagles fan are pretty, pretty happy, happy about that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> 
Well, that's going to do it for the Rochester Press Box, brought to you by the Genesee Brew House. I'd like to thank Carol Falk, Mike Catalana. Good to be here. And, of course, the Charles K. Clay Fan Club I'm Bob president. Fan of Charles K. and Charles Clay, both of them. I'll there take you them. go. Yeah, you're welcome. Well, any port in a storm, right? <laughs> All right. I'm Dave Yates. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you again next week.